Okay. So, we've been talking about transfer programs, different programs the government has to transfer money from one group of people to another group of people. And so we're like unemployment insurance is transferring money from people who have jobs because they take money out of your paycheck and then they give it to people who've lost their jobs, right? Um, Medicare is getting health care from people who have money and have jobs, whatever, giving health care to people that don't have money and have jobs, that kind of thing. So the biggest one that we're, the biggest of these programs we're going to look at it today is the old age survivor and disability insurance, what we commonly call Social Security. And usually we think Social Security, we think about it, you turn 65, nowadays it's 67. You turn 67 and you get to retire, woohoo, and you, the government pays you for the rest of your life. But the disability, when y'all hear people, you know, they, they throw out your back or whatever, or something, and you know, they, they, claim they file for disability, they're filing with the Social Security Administration. It is actually those disability checks are coming from the Social Security Fund as well. So the more people that are drawing disability, that's going to be that much less money available for you for when you retire. So, encourage help. Uh, don't encourage people to be like Homer Simpson who found out that if you ended up gaining enough, he, he figured out he could gain enough weight that he could get on disability and then he always burned a big power plant down. And, anyway, uh, well, he's trying to get disability, but now he found out he could work from home and, and anyway, I always burned a big power plant down. But, um, and then the survivor part of it, we'll talk about this for somebody that is dependent on the income of a social security drawer and that social security person dies and they can still get benefits from the group from their spouse. Um, the kids, dependent kids are people drawing social security. Think about it, dependent kids are people drawing social security. Oh man, with young kids. Right, well I mean, but they, they could be, uh, kids like uh, my nephew, he's got autism, so he's probably gonna be living with my brother and his wife all of his life, kind of thing, so he would be a dependent, adult dependent on them, so when they turn, so that's, so it is. But generally, Social Security, the old age part of it, and here's the thing, and keep this in mind Monday in the finance class here. It is intended to supplement retirement. It is not intended to be your retirement program. Right? It, it, that, that's it. Okay, I have it right there. It's never intended to be the sole source of retirement income. Retiring is a privilege, not a right. Show me where in the Constitution or anything it says you have the right to retire. When you turn 65, you graduated and you don't have to work anymore. It doesn't say it. If you get to the point in your life where I think I got enough money that I can live off of it for the rest of my life, you can quit working. If you hit that when you age age 30, good on you. If you win the lottery tomorrow, good on you. If you don't, you keep working until you get to that point. And maybe they can get to that point when you turn 65 and the money that you save plus a little bit of money to the government will get you where you need to be. But if you don't, you keep working. Because it's, I mean, that's just, nobody's going to pay you to do nothing. But if we did, I know in my business class we talk Maslow's hierarchy. Did we talk Maslow's hierarchy in here this semester or last semester? Really? Okay. So, master's hierarchy, safety, survival, and then you got to that need for affiliation, need for achievement, need for uh, self-actualization. The upper level psychological needs, well down below, the first two, that was the, those maintenance factors that we were talking about, the maintenance things about safety, survival, and it was like safety, survival, security, the word here, security, your social security check, is only going to get you enough to check the bottom two boxes on Master's hierarchy: safety, survival, basic food, basic clothing, basic shelter. You ain't going to be there. Ain't enough room in the Social Security check for anything about your happiness. The upper part of Master's hierarchy is about what makes you happy. The bottom part of Master's hierarchy is about what keeps you alive. In order to get to the top part, you get happy, and that's all Social Security is. If you're going to live off of you just Social Security. Plan on survival, but not living. Give the difference there. I just wrap, it, wrap your minds around that one right off the bat. 
basic survival, basic food, basic clothing, basic shelter. How many of you know somebody that your grandparents, great grandparents, your neighbors, what that is living off social security checks? And only their social security checks. How well are they doing? Barely speaking by. Yes. It ain't that great of a living. We'll talk about how not great of a living it is in a couple of slides. To qualify for Social Security, just like any other retirement. Uh, just like any other insurance or something like that, you've got to play, you've got to pay in order to participate. If you don't put money into the retirement fund, you don't get money out of the retirement fund. You have to put money into the Social Security fund in order to qualify to take money out of the Social Security fund. Aren't you required to do it? Well, if you sell them, up, if, if I hire you, you're my employee, yeah, I've got to take money out of your check, put it in Social Security, and then i got to pay money on your behalf of the Social Security. But if, I, if you're self-employed, if I'm self-employed, I don't have to do it. There is no requirement for you to participate in Social Security. There is a requirement for your employers to participate you in Social Security. How's that for work? But, and uh, like the one people I talked to, the guy that used to rent our land to have raise cows, guy's name is Ralph, he's not here anymore finally, but Ralph, self-employed farmer, barely squeaking by because hey, he's farming. So he's barely squeaking by, so can he afford to be coughing up? In this case, it would be 12 and a half percent of his paycheck to go into Social Security because he doesn't have an employer to pitch in and have a, no. So did Ralph put money into Social Security? No. Was Ralph still working at age 95? Yes. Age 95. 95. For everyone, that's what happens if you don't. He didn't save for retirement and he didn't put in Social Security. So he was working until the yes. end. If that doesn't want it, if you don't want that to be you, start saving. I'm going to say that phrase several times today. Start saving. I'm going to be saying that a bunch in class Monday, and this work is going to be saying that a bunch in class Monday. To qualify for Social Security, like they take a little bit of money out of your check, and then your employer matches that. They take six and a quarter percent from you. Your employer takes six and a quarter percent of your money, and it gets put into the Social Security fund. And if they do that for every three months that you're putting money into the Social Security fund, you earn a credit. And once you get to 40 credits, that's 10 years worth of working, then congratulations, you're qualified. You're fully qualified. You're going to start drawing Social Security. But well, you'll be eligible to draw Social Security when you're eligible to draw Social Security. And they'll start sending you a letter every year that says, you know, okay, you're in the Social Security program and based on your earnings income, when you do hit age 67, this is what your Social Security check is going to look like. It's called a benefits letter and they send them out every year. If you take early retirement, oh, because the word retirement, that's the wrong word. But if you choose, choose to draw at age 62, this is the size of your check. If you choose to wait until 67, like you should, this is going to be the size of your check. Once you start getting that letter, guess what? You're in the program. But you're not in the program if you're not in there. If you work nine and a half years, and you're getting another. You gotta work 10, and it doesn't have to be 10 years in a row. You work two, three years, take a couple years off, work two, three years, take a couple years off, get a duck of aliens, come back, work a couple more years. Once you get to that 10 years, you put you contributed 40 months, taking money out of your paycheck, you're gonna be there. The size of the check doesn't matter. The fact that the, the, it's that you're being paid in is what checks the box to qualify to get it. The size of your check is going to impact how much money you put in is going to dictate the size of the checks you get when you turn 62, 67, whatever. But it doesn't really determine your qualification at first one. So if you take it at 62, you're going to live with that after 67. They increase the amount of the paycheck. Dramatically. Oh, we'll talk about that in a few slides. Um, So once you get your 40 credits, you qualify and you get benefits when you get older. Um, how big is your social security check? It's going to depend on three things. Think of it. Well, let me go back a little bit. The social security fund. 
it's not like they take money out of your check. They take twelve and the six and a quarter for you, and six and a quarter for your boss. And they, they're not putting it in a drawer that's labeled with your name on it, and they're saving it up and building it up, and then when you turn six and seven or whatever, they start opening that drawer out and start writing checks. It doesn't work that way. What happens is they take all the money from all the workers and they dump it in this one bin. All the money comes in and just metaphorically think I pretend like I got a bucket right here. Why do you say something we're gonna build a make a bucket for the sign? The money goes in. And then when you turn 62, you get to reach in and pay some money out. When you turn 67, you can get a bigger handful out. And each month afterwards. So the money that you're putting in now is the money this main grandma's check now. Is, so the question is, is how much, how fast is money going into this bucket? How fast is that money coming out of that bucket? Have y'all heard the Social Security is not going to be around when y'all retire? Have y'all heard that? Yeah. What they're talking about is what's ended up happening is we're getting to the tipping point, thanks to our baby burgers. A bunch of people retiring. What's ended up happening is money has been going into the bucket faster than it's been leaving the bucket, which is what we need. But we're getting to that point now where the money leaving that bucket is going out faster than money coming into that bucket. So instead of that bucket getting fuller and fuller and fuller, that bucket's getting emptier, 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 emptier. The question is, how empty is that bucket going to be 50 years from now when y'all are lining up to stick your hand in there? So there might not be any money in there. There might just be a couple of spiders. Maybe a roach to lick you, how about that? So, and so that, that's the concern there. So it's not like, well, I put in, I'm guaranteed I'm going to be there. Well, the government's kind of said, well, you're going to do it so does it something. Because who is the government of the United States? We the people. And we the people have made a promise to we the people. So kind of, unless Congress says, okay, sorry, y'all, it's over. And we're going to take all the rest of that money and we're going to give it to NASA to speed up putting people on the moon and all the rest of y'all, y'all are on your own for retirement for the rest of your life. Is the government going to do that? Is any senator or congressperson that did that, are they going to get reelected? No. So it's probably not going to happen, but they, there is some hard decisions that are going to have to be made. I'm a little bit ahead of myself. But we've got to do things to either increase the amount of money going into the bucket or slow down how much money is leaving the bucket. So they started doing a little bit of that second a little while ago when they adjusted retirement age. Um, it used to be 65. Or now it's somewhere between 67 and 70. Guess what? For y'all, it's going to be 70. Uh, and right now, it's going to be 70. They haven't adjusted, unless they adjust it again in future. Uh, no, maybe 67 yet. Yeah, they're sticking, but they're somewhere along the line, you're going to have to change that. Correct one here. Okay. History lesson part two. Social Security. Any uh, any history majors? When when, when did Social Security Act get passed? 1938. In the 1930s. What was the life expectancy in the 1930s? It was in the 60s. 60, 65. Let's call it 65. And retirement age is 65. What is the definition of the word life expectancy? How long Technically, yeah, yeah. Life, like, okay, Sam's getting close. What is it? That is the age where we expect half of you to live to. Half of the people, as the life expectancy is 65, we're thinking half the people are going to be dead before they turn 65. Only half the people are going to make it past 65. Nowadays, it's knocking on 80. For women in America, life expectancy is 80. For men, it's down to 77. It used to be like 78, 79, it was closer, but the, us guys have kind of been taking doing some more stupid stuff in the last couple of years. And so that never, it's not that, that, it's not because we're getting older and having heart attacks a little bit earlier, which is true, but a lot of it is because we've got a bunch of young people getting killed doing stupid stuff, you know, drugs and gangs and that kind of stuff. So the young men are getting killed off earlier, which is bringing a whole average down. Right. So, guess what? Half of y'all in this room, Assuming I'll stay out of gangs and drugs, half of you are going to live past your 80th birthday. Congratulations. Half of you probably aren't quite going to make it there. But in 1935, let's just say 
because it's close, I don't know the exact, it was 65. And retirement age was 65. So what was happening then is the government saying, half the people that put money in that bucket aren't going to get a single penny out of it. And then if those people that do pull money, start, start taking money out, okay, a lot of them, you know, that life expectancy is 65, so three quarters of the rest of them are probably going to be gone by the time they're 70, right? So half of the people that put money in are never going to draw a single penny out. But now, what's happening? The life expectancy is fading. So the thinking is, guess what? Half of you are going to be drawing money, taking money out of this bucket for 15 or more years. That's the problem. Because we're living longer, we're healthier. And the Social Security program wasn't set up for that amount of people taking that much money for that long out of that bucket. So what do we do? Option number one is, okay, y'all, y'all got to start putting more money into this bucket. So instead of 12 and a half percent, bump it up to 15, 20, 25 percent of your paycheck. So y'all are coughing up 12 and a half percent, your employers are coughing up 12 and a half percent, and that's 25 percent. Or they got to delay when you can draw money out of the bucket by, I don't know, killing you? If it, well, Joseph Stalin's grandson, this sort goes in. Um, option number two is move the retirement date. To, sorry, y'all, y'all can't start reaching your hand into that bucket until you're 75 or 80 instead of days, taking money out at age 67. Or option number three is, okay, you can take money out. Nowhere near enough. And the point of this is they can't really lower the benefits because the point of this is to give you enough money to survive. So they can't really shrink the size of the check because it's barely enough to survive as it is. Otherwise, it's a waste. If we're only going to give you a quarter of the money that you need to buy groceries, well, then what's the point? You're still going to start the set, right? If you can only eat one week a month, you're still gone, right? So they can't really reduce a whole lot the size of the check. Can they? Which, but we'll get to that. Like they do adjust it based on the inflation rate year to year to year. But, and technically, they could reduce the social security checks a little bit because what they do is they connect the size of the benefits. I'm way ahead of myself now. They connect the size of the check. It's increased based on inflation. Prices go up 3% this year. Well, grandma needs 3% more money to live the same survival that she's living before. So we increase your social security check 3%. If rights go up by 8%, well, we increase your check by 8%. But well, what about those years like 2008, 2009, where prices went down by 1%? The Social Security Administration said, okay, Grandma, you don't quite need as much money. We're going to cut your benefits. And what's Grandma going to do? She could pull out a state knife and cut the person, all right? Because Grandma's hardcore. So, that's it. so there has been a few times during the years where the social security check got raised or stay the same when you should have gotten lowered. So there might be a little bit of wiggle room to knock those benefits down, but only by a few percentage points. So that's kind of going to be kind of insignificant. And you're going to have everybody over the age of 16 mad at everybody in Washington, D.C. So that, that, that one's not going to happen, right? So what, what needs to happen, and I just, I don't know why the politicians haven't woke up to it. My personal opinion, what they need to do is it needs to be, what's y'all, when you turn 25, I'll make it up and up. When you turn 25, we ask the question, what's life expectancy? Okay, that's your retirement date. When you're 25 years old, you graduate from college, that kind of stuff, it's time to start saving money, and okay, uh, at that point, the life expectancy is 80. Well, you need to start planning on working until you're 80. Because you ain't going to be drawing social security until you're 80. If the life expectancy is 90 when you turn 20, then that's how that's when your retirement age is. Because why, the, the life expect, why, why is life expectancy so much higher? Because you're so much healthier. So much more capable of working. Back in the day, half of people who dead at age 65, so how healthy were the other half? Not very healthy, and we needed to get them out of the workforce because a lot of them were danger, dangerous on the workforce because they were so old and weak and not healthy. Right? But a 65 year old person back then is the equivalent of like a 95 year old person now. Right? 
And you can't imagine very many 90, 95 year old people going to work, right? And that's the way it was. So well, right now we have a lot of very perfectly healthy 60 some odd year old people. They're just, well, I mean, it, it just magic number. I could quit working. For absolutely no right reason other than some date on a calendar. It needs to be adjusted to the retirement, it, it, the retirement date needs to be adjusted to something to do with the life expectancy. If it goes up a little, the retirement date moves out a little. If it goes up a lot, it goes out a lot. But they need to tell it to you early enough on. That's why I picked like the 25th birthday. So you know you've got 40 years to start planning for retirement. 50 years to start planning for retirement, planning your work career, planning accordingly. Because they can't come up to, it would really suck if they come up to you, your grandma, y'all are young enough. Y'all's grandparents may not be old enough to retire yet. But your grandma sitting there, okay, I'm saving enough money and I get to retire in two in, in the next six months. Woohoo. Then they come up there and say, sorry, you gotta wait another 12 years. That was suck, right? You gotta use the warning. Last time they adjusted it, it's probably been 15 years ago when they adjusted it, just going from 65 to 67. And it's a transition period in between, and it took a long time we did, and it was like, well, I keep longer than 15 years. Well in the future, before they adjusted, and they only adjusted in increments up to 67. It just, and, and we actually haven't finished that transition yet, believe it or not. It's, so there are some people out there that their retirement date is age 66 and eight months. And other people age 66 and three months. It just depended on what year they were born in that little window where they set the, the trigger. So they need that's the only real solution we have to start security. There's only two. Number one, bump their retirement date out to life expectancy. Or number two, they could take more out of y'all's shift. Which makes you happier? Write your, call, write your, write your Congress printer and tell them. And make a recommendation because guess what? Y'all want to have a social security check when you retire, right? If you don't think it's going to exist, make yourself self employed and don't contribute to it, right? Be part of the problem, not the solution. No. So, and they say unless the president comes to support it, they get mod be gone. Well, that's it. it. President, Congress, I mean, they all got to work together on it. There's nothing the president can do on this without Congress, and they all have to come up with a plan. But at this point, unless something drastic happens, it, it is going to go away. It is, that lucky is going to get ended. Right, we could have like another smallpox like an epidemic if they have a third of population that dies in time. And you'd be all like, you mean have a chance to break it. You can start digging through civil files and that kind of stuff. Ooh, Android is cool. Just now. It's pretty sad, man, right? Hmm? It's pretty sad, man, right? Cool. <laughs> I guess some cows, I could probably make it out too, but anyway. Um, start feeding them the wrong things. Yeah, I'm gonna fly over Chicago and travel. Cow. Oh, uh, I just went to the dark place. So, okay. so, when you do write to it, say, I want to collect my social security checks, you can't keep working while collecting your social security checks. So, it ain't retirement. I don't, people use the word retirement, and it, it, it's not. It's if you're old enough, you can start getting these checks. A lot of people use that as their retirement thing. Okay. Uh, but the size of those checks when you collect from the Social Security Administration depends on a couple of things. Number one, how what was your income while you worked? If you didn't put much money into this bucket, don't expect to get a lot of money out of the bucket. Right? If you put a bunch of money in that bucket, well, it's kind of fair that you get a bunch of money out of the bucket. Right? The more you put in, the more you take out. But number two is what is your income after you retire? You may put a bunch of money in that bucket, but if you got crap tons of money, you don't really need a social security check. Does Bill Gates need a social security check? No. Because no. he's got because what's the point of this? Safety and survival. Does Bill have more than enough money for survival? Uh, yeah. So that's going to end up shrinking the amount of money that you would get in this check. Because he's got plenty of income afterwards. He can still get it. He can qualify to get the minimum of, I think it's a dollar. It's either a dollar or $40. I'm having a mind like, well, it's on the, one of the next couple of slides. 
you could file to the Social Security Administration and get that little itty bitty minuscule check. But then, how, how would people treat him if they found out that he did it? He ain't gonna do it. It ain't worth his time to deal with it. All right. So, if you don't need it, you don't expect to get a whole lot of it. But if his bill put a bunch of money into that Social Security fund? Probably. Because he was making a couple million dollars a year salary, but that's the thing. Most of what he got was stock options that they don't go to take Social Security out on that. But his million dollar, two million dollar, five million dollars a year actual salary, a chunk of that went into the Social Security fund. So he put a bunch of money in, which would allow him to do the next two units. People, names, humans. Bob. Bob and Sally. Sally. Okay. Uh, Sally makes fifty thousand a year. Bob makes twenty five thousand a year. So uh, I'm going to say this is how. Uh, Sally, she makes twice as much as Bob. Sally's putting twice as much money into the bucket as Bob. But when it does settle, Sally's Social Security check is not going to be twice the size of Bob's Social Security check. Because Sally's not going to be in as great a need of it as Bob is going to be. That's the way that one's going to work out. Uh, so you kind of have that little anti poverty thing going on there. It's helping people that need it more are going to get more than those that need it less. So if you had. Another human? Jim. Jim. Uh, if she only put in a dollar, a dollar a year, a dollar a dollar a quarter, 40 quarters or whatever, you know, it, it, and his income after he retired was still a dollar, because Chip was, I don't know what the problem is with Chip, but you know, his social security check, check may end up being bigger than he ever ever said. So, how much money did you put into the bucket? How much money are you making along with your social security check when the social security checks start coming in? And also, the age you start receiving the checks. Your retirement date is 67. That's when you fully qualify. But you can start collecting early at age 62. If you're pretty unhealthy and you don't think you're going to make it to 67 or 70 or something like that, you might start drawing early. Or if you're like, I'm pretty close to having enough money to retire, so yeah, I can go ahead and draw a little bit early, and you know, my social security check won't be that big, but it'll let me get retired five years earlier. I'm worth it's worth it. You kind of have to do that math there. If you think you're gonna live a long life, you need to postpone it. But generally, 67 is when you get your full amount. If you get 62, you try to get it to 62, you probably only get about two thirds of the money. Wait that extra five years. Because what are you doing? Five less years of putting money into that bucket, five more years taking money out of that bucket, that's a 10 year swing there, all right? Compared to the, well, I don't know, 30, 40 years worth of working career you're gonna have putting money into that bucket, that's a big swing, right? So that's why at 62, you're only gonna get about three quarters of what you would get if you wait until 67. But you can say, well, I'll wait until 70. And your benefits will grow to larger than 100% of what they should be if you wait because the government's like doing us a favor and putting money into that bucket for two extra years and taking money out of that bucket to fewer years. You're doing us a solid, so you'll end up getting more than 100%, but then once you get past 70, your benefits aren't gonna increase anymore, so once you turn 70, go ahead and fill out the paperwork. Because there's nothing to gain. So here's that transition that I was talking about that they worked it out in it's the late 90s or early 2000s. I really love it. It's killing me that I can't. It's early 2000s when they adjusted this. And so they said, okay, those of y'all born between 1942, this is going to be y'all's great grandparents. They get full retirement in 65. Those of you that were born between 1943 and 1955, well, it's 66. Those of you from after 1955 is 67. But for those people that were born, you know, in 1943, it's going to be like 65 years in one month. Those people that were born in like 1950, it's going to be like 65 years in eight months. It, they did it as a graduated step plan. But where we're at, where y'all are, how many of y'all were born after 1955? Everybody in this room, including me. Don't judge me. Yeah, so it's like it's 67 for y'all, not 62. So do you take the retirement benefits early? I should use that word. Do you get your social security check at 62, 67, or wait till 70? 
Question number one is, how long do you think you're going to live? According to your life expectancy, you should be living until 80, right? Especially for, especially for you ladies, 80, you go girl, 70s, I mean guys, a little bit less than that. But what happens if you look at the full payoff? If you were to chart out, if you, the green line here is showing if you started at age 62, your check is going to be smaller because what? Age 62, 63, 64, 65, 60, you're getting checks, or otherwise you'd be getting none, right? But what ends up happening, if you can hold out until, if you wait until 67 to collect full benefits, you'll be money ahead at age 74. But you're going to live longer than age 74? So if you're going to live past 74, well then you should wait. Because every bit that you're doing, living after age 74, you could be money ahead in total. The checks each month you could be getting, each month it could be bigger, and that total amount, if you add all those checks together, it's going to end up being bigger if you go past 74. But if you think you're going to make it past 82, which ladies, almost half of y'all should get there, right? Well, in that case, you'll be money ahead if you wait until 70. Because their social security checks will be even bigger. But you got the two things. A, do you think that you're going to be able to live that long? And B, do you think you can work that long? Can you stand working until age 70? Knowing that half of the people that you went to high school with have been out of work for the last five, six, seven years. And they're not exactly living it up off of their small little social security checks, but you know who they are. But, right. So. If you have a job that ain't killing you, that ain't driving you nuts, and you are in reasonable health, when you get into your mid to late 50s, and you start doing your retirement planning and that kind of stuff, that hmm, maybe I ought to wait till 70, get that extra large check. Good. Yep. Small, large, regular, and then extra large, right? So if you can wait till 70 to get the extra large, You'll end up being money ahead. So guess what? If you're going to, but here, you see everything grab your mind around. Total adding all of those checks together. But if you manage to live until 90, the difference between waiting till 70 versus retiring 67, all total added up is about 80 some odd thousand dollars. Is it worth it? To get an extra $80,000 spread out over 20 some odd years, is that worth it for you to keep working for those extra few years instead of retiring early and spending quality time with the kids, the grandkids, and all of that kind of stuff? That's the question. Um, especially if you do that for questions. But anyway. I can't advise you. I wish to do. It's too soon for you to know which to do. Because it just depends. And like it, they may bend the rules. They may change the rules to where you know it ain't 67 anymore, it's 75. So it might end up when, when y'all go to retire, it might be 72, 75, 72, 75, and 80. That changes the math dramatically. And I don't know about your health and that kind of situation, whatever your situations are. Yep. So you really can't start adjusting this until you get closer. Let's just fight. If you're already sticking out healthy and you've already had three heart attacks and that kind of stuff in before your 50th birthday, call it a day at age 62, right? Smaller checks are better than dying before the big ones come in, right? So, way to collect how long you think you can live. Second one is how much money do you think you're going to need? If your house is paid for, your cars are paid for, the college bills, you, you've already paid each kids through college and that kind of stuff because you're nice and decided to pay their college so they ain't got to describe it the same in the way you had to when you went to college, right? Because y'all lost some people. No reaction whatsoever. Really. Um, but maybe you don't need a whole lot of money. So then go ahead and retire early if you don't need a whole lot of money. If you're like, well, I hate people, I hate the world, and I'm never going to travel, I'm never going on vacation for getting any Florida vacation, Hawaiian cruise, no, I'm never going to go anywhere with the Walmart food line. 
you don't need a lot of money, so maybe you can enjoy your retirement. It just depends on what, what kind of lifestyle you want to live. Are you still making house payments? Well, you probably ought to keep working. And the third thing is how much money do you have? If you Bill Gates, if Bill Gates was insane enough to file for Social Security, he ain't going to file for Social Security. It don't matter the size of that check. It's dropping a bucket compared to all the money he already has. Right? And if y'all independently wealthy, and if y'all won the lottery or something like that, I'll live a day. Uh, the uh, the 2018 numbers, some of them I've updated this. I got a couple of 2019 numbers and some of them I only got the 2018 numbers for. The minimum Social Security check in order to file would be a dollar a year. If Bill Gates was filed for Social Security, that would be his check. It ain't worth the risk of a paper cut to fill out the form to him to get that dollar, right? Just ain't gonna do it. Uh, the maximum, maximum, the biggest Social Security check you could possibly get if everything lined up right based on you put in a crap ton of money when you're working you've got zero income when you do quit working and you got zero savings and all the other stars everything aligned because there's other rules and stuff that we need to know. the most you can get is thirty three thousand dollars a year thirty three four fifty six it's not the middle of the night maybe yeah, it's kind of the lower end of middle class. That's kind of where you're going to land there. Um, most of you, hopefully, when y'all graduate from here, your starting salary on your first job is a brand new, fresh college graduate. It's hopefully going to be like thirty thousand dollars a year. Two thousand seven hundred and eighty-eight dollars a month. If you try, if you got to make a house payment out of that, forget about it because that's going to be a third of the half of it right there. All right. That's the most you can get. The average Social Security check is fourteen hundred and four dollars. If I was to take a guess, your grandma's check is going to be close to that. Why is that four dollars matter? Hmm? Why is that four dollars? Yeah, you gotta remember that four dollars there. That's for grandma cut you over. But the average Social Security check is fourteen hundred four dollars, and that is one third. Of the average salary that a person is making while working. So you take it a two thirds cut in pay if that you're going to quit working and live off Social Security. It gets better. Um, oh, no, I'm going to get it somewhere. Okay, I'll do it. Don't have a seizure looking at this, but I, I, there's something else I want to tell you, but I have it on slide a little bit later. Just drag your mind around. For the Social Security checks, for retired people, that average number is actually a little bit lower. 13,064 is the average, and there are four in 2018. Just call, let's call it 46 million Americans are drawing Social Security checks. 46 million out of the 320, 330 million of us. Where's the 200, 330? Okay. Spouses can draw off of their spouse's social security. Go back in time to like the 1950s and yeah, you got the, what the, the husband and wife, the husband work, the husband's draw a paycheck, and the husband some money from the husband's going into Social Security fund. But the wife, she stayed at home and raised the kids. Dewey, Dewey, Louie, Louie, all right, whatever the kids are. Uh, and but she's is she working? Yeah, she's working raising the kids. Is she working in the eyes of the government? Not really. So she's not contributing any money to Social Security, but by taking care of his kids, taking care of the household and that kind of stuff, it's helping enable him to be going out and making money and continuing to work, right? But so she can file for uh, making a claim toward the Social Security that he put in. Because part of the reason why he made as much money as he did is because obviously you're taking care of the kids. 
So part of the reason why the Social Security Fund got as much money away from him as it did is because I was here taking care of the kids, so show me the money. That's the way that works. And then it even goes by extension, like, you know, for divorces and that kind of stuff, we're no longer live together, but is slow. So, and so somebody like my mother, she worked for a handful of years, but then once the kids came along, she stopped working, and then after we got old enough, she went back to work again, but she, her overall lifetime income, she got her 40 credits, so she could draw Social Security on her own. But the other thing you can do is you can draw 50% of your spouse, whichever number was higher. And Deb, he was working the whole time, he was making more money overall than she did or whatever, so his Social Security check was bigger. Half of his check is bigger than what she would have qualified for because she didn't put a whole lot of money in. So you can file that way. So that's just, that's just the detail. Be able to keep it in the back of your mind 40 years from now. You have not. But there are some people that are claim, making claims off of their spouse's social security contribution. And those people didn't put as much in, right? So guess what? They didn't get as much out. So, what's your name? Mrs. Cleaver, Beaver's mother, whatever. We believe it to Beaver. Because I said in the 1950s. Right? So, you know, sure, Social Security check is going to be like half the size of her husband's. Because, yeah, she's helping him put more money in, but was she helping him? Did he put twice as much money in because she was staying home and watching the kids? Hmm. No. There are some kids that can make claims off of their parents. Social Security. That is only if you are dependent upon your parents. This would be the case like Liam, my nephew, when 20 years from now, 30 years from now, he used to, he got off this, so he's going to be living with my brother and his wife their whole lifetime. And so he's depending on my brother, he's going to be dependent on my brother's income and my sister in law's income all of his life. So when their income, part of their income is going to be Social Security, he can be drawing from it. Because he never had a chance to earn on his own and he's dependent on their income. And look at how many people do that? Not even a million. Small number there. He, he will be living with them. So what was that? What's the point of drawing Dad? He's going to live with Dad. Because they have extra expenses of taking care of an extra person still dependent. So if you think of it as a household, the household has the extra expense of being their dependent person. So in order for three people to be surviving off of the social security money, instead of two people surviving off of that social security money, it's got to be bigger. So that's the adjustment. So they're not taking six hundred dollars from his dad check. No, they're, they're not. They're, yeah, they're adding to it. This is an additive. They're not taking. They won't take it from Dave's and giving it to Liam. It's just going to be Dave. You're getting yours, and Liam. And, have, have, you have a right to draw some money on Liam's behalf as well to it open. Yeah, yeah no. Yeah. The, the, the spouse, what's her name? What's her name? Filing is not going to be taken away from his, you know, from the Leave it to Beaver family, whatever. It's just she can get some because he put some in, but he's still getting his full amount he qualified for. The disability part for those people that have real or some people are claiming that they can't work anymore. This disability is for people that cannot work. Cannot work. That's different from unemployed. You can't work and you're not. You can't find a job or something like that, but you're physically capable. This is for people that are physically or mentally incapable of working. We can't just throw them out on the streets. That, so they're incapable of working. That's what the disability program is. Disabled workers. I worked, put money into the bucket, and now I can no longer work. How much can I get out of that bucket? The average disability check is not even twelve hundred dollars a month. It's two hundred below the average. Twelve hundred divided by four is three hundred dollars a week. I'm going to make a, this slide that I wanted to look at a few minutes ago that I can do. Well, I'm going to draw a comparison between these numbers and minimum wage. And guess where we're at? Minimum wage. That's what I'm talking about here. We're dancing around minimum wage. That's checks you get when you're living off of Social Security. 
for your disability. Because what's the point of minimum wage? We talked about that the other day. It's to give you the money when you're working to make sure you make enough money for basic food, clothing, shelter, and survival. Well, what's the point of Social Security? To give you enough money for basic food, clothing, basic survival. Same aims, the same purposes, but guess what? The same numbers. So if you're going to live off of Social Security and only Social Security, plan on living a minimum wage lifestyle. Which brings me back to the make sure you ain't got a house payment. And make sure you ain't got a car payment because you ain't gonna be able to afford it. How many of you can afford a how, how many of you make a minimum wage and make a car payment at the moment? Don't raise your hands. Or if you are, congratulations, but you ain't also got a house payment. You're living with your parents if you're doing that, I promise you. All right. The spouses of disabled workers can file a claim, but they're only getting an average of $335 a month. And then children of disabled workers, there again, they can get some money, but it's small. Two. So the point of this, anyways, you ain't getting rich, you ain't living large, you're barely getting by. How long do you show up and, you know, take Social Security for, for like 15 years? No, it, it, it depends on the circumstances as far as, it depends. It, 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 as far as their, their dependency as a child, I become disabled. I don't know, I have the top of my head cut off in the skill size or something like that. And so Joseph and Sarah, my two younger kids, are dependent on my income now. So they can draw until well, Joseph turns 18. You're a man, you're out on your own. Sarah turns 18, you're a woman, you're out on your own. So they will be drawing for just a few years. But in the case of like going back to Liam, we should be living with my brother for all of his life if Dave was to get disabled all of his life. Well, Liam is dependent on David's day's income for all of his life, so he would be drawing the entire time. Survivors and turns. This one's complicated. Instead of me getting disabled on the job, I get killed on the job. Um, and I have dependent kids like Dave. Okay, Dave gets killed on a job. Liam is dependent on Dave's income. And so Liam, they can file, get money to help keep Liam afloat for the government. $860 a month, and only even like two young kids are getting that. The widowed mothers and fathers, if your parents are dependent on you, if your parents have health problems and y'all are like, well, no, we're not going to put you in a home. We're going to let you live with us. We're going to take care of you because we love you and you took care of us. You changed my diapers. I'm going to change your diapers and all that kind of stuff. Good on you. So if your parents are depending on your income and then you get killed, then they can file for some money. But none of these numbers are very big. A non-disabled widow or widower would be based on were, were they disabled when I got killed? Were they not disabled when I got killed? But the rules for that survivor's insurance based on well you have to be a widower over 16. Widow or widower. That's the husband who lost his wife is a widower. Uh, but if you're under 16, if my wife got killed tomorrow, uh, but if she gets killed I said no not just but if she got killed tomorrow, I ain't over 60. I ain't collecting. But the thinking is, is when you're over 60, you knock it on the door of retirement, you had retirement plans and all this kind of stuff, and you were planning on you know, getting your check and their check too, and now one of them is gone, and so that check ain't coming, and your retirement plans are screwed, and you don't have much time to adjust. That's the point of this. Because you don't, you, as you get older, because you're losing out on the opportunity to make adjustments to that situation. If you're disabled and you lose your spouse, you still got to be over 15 before you can start qualifying. Or if you're the surviving dependent parents, which I thought about if your parents were living with you and you're paying their bills instead of the other way around. There is a supplemental part of it. This is barely getting you minimum wage. But there's supplemental social security if that's not enough to actually get you above the poverty line. Because if you, your spouse, your eight kids, 
Okay, any tentacles or these? Okay, wait for reaction here. Uh, so there is a part of Social Security that's aimed specifically at low income households to give them the extra supplement on top of that. And those, on average, the payments are $771 a week, providing more cash or the basic needs of food, clothing, and shelter. But specifically, it ain't just for people with little or no income. But people with little or no income, or old, blind, disabled, can't work, pretty much can't work, probably can't work. Their income is so low, health costs, health costs, health costs. Minimum wage lifestyle isn't going to be enough. If you got high health, if you're old and have high health bills, because you got that fifty dollars worth of heart medication, and then that thirty dollars worth of blood pressure medication, and then whatever else, so you you only bring in thirteen hundred dollars a month, and you spend two hundred of it on your pills alone, and then you got to go like on oh, rent, food, and that kind of stuff. So that's what this supplement is. Not just because well, I'm poor. Uh, if you are in one of these other conditions where you Realistically, can't do anything to improve your financial situation, and your financial situation sucks. That's when this program is going to kick in. So there ain't going to be many people getting this one, right? So they won't file. Yeah, you can file and qualify for more than one program. And just, just like when you came here to college and you fill out the FAFSA and they look to see what kind of grants or what kind of scholarships, what kind of everything you qualify for. Some of you got two or three things, some of you only got one, some of you got nothing. Same thing here. They're going to look and they're going to say, oh, oh you're blind? Okay, well, maybe we can get you some extra money. You're disabled? Maybe we can get you some extra money. Well, you definitely qualify for this because you put money in and then look, well, we get you this, get you 10L, add up and get you what you can get. Um, I already talked about this. I should have had this slide earlier. Those benefits, the size of your social security check and the size of my social security check, in large part is based on how much money we put in. Sally is working, to making twice as much money as Bob, year after year after year for the 40 years that they were working. Sally put in twice as much money as Bob. Sally is going to get a bigger check than Bob. It's not going to be twice as big as Bob's, but it's going to be bigger than Bob's. Okay, and that's what we're saying here. The benefits are adjusted progressively, so the benefits for low income person that you love. Perfect. I got over here. A person who. Okay. Sally? Um, that equipment thing. A person with Sally, a person whose average income is $50,000 a year, will not get twice the money as Bob, someone who only makes $25,000 a year. She will get more, but not twice as much. Ideally, what the government wants is for you to wait until 67 or maybe even 70 before you start getting money out of the bucket. They want you putting money into this bucket that extra five or seven years. Yeah, we'll go with that. Uh, the extra four, five, seven years, more you put money in, less you taking money out. But the other thing is, the size you check gets impacted by the amount of money that you have. So the government would like it if you had a lot of income, so you don't need to take a lot of money out of this bucket when you do decide to start drawing money out. So the government would like it if you kept working past 62, past 65, past 70. Because if you keep working, you keep drawing paychecks, so you are wholly dependent on taking money out of this bucket, you won't have to take as much money out of this bucket. But it can't be the situation of every extra dollar that you make working is one less dollar that you get on your social security check. What are y'all gonna do? Not work. If I can make the same amount of money not working that I can get working, what are we gonna do? Not working, stay home, watch SpongeBob all day. We're done with your studio. SpongeBob all the way, right? So. But what they did is we 
we want you to work. So we want you to work to where, guess what? If you want to draw that early Social Security, you want to start taking that money out at age 62, well, if you make $17,640, you can make $17,640 before they start to reduce your size and your pay, your Social Security track. And then, if you make more than that $17,640, they are going to start reducing your check, but for every extra dollar you earn, they're only going to take 50 cents off your check. So you absolutely should keep working and make it at $17,640. And you still have the incentive of working beyond that point because you still are financially going to end up money ahead because your paycheck, your social security check is going to be shrinking slower than your paycheck is going to be growing. Right. So, but ideally, they want you to work until sixty-seven and beyond. I mean, when you're sixty-seven and beyond. So in that case, you turn sixty-seven and you're collecting the full-size checks. You can earn, let's just call it forty-seven thousand dollars a year before they start trending your check. And then when they treat you check in, we'll take 33 cents for every dollar you earn. Because that's incentivizing you to be putting more and more and more money into that bucket by delaying until 65, and delaying until 67, and encouraging you to keep working so then you're you're contributing more, earning less. With me on all that. Something else to wrap our minds around. Labor force participation, people over 65. What does this mean? 1950? 46% of the people over age 65 were still considering those workers. We're still working. Just as just they turned 65, they weren't retiring. Half of them were still working at 65. Where are we at now? The latest numbers I got was 2014. Not even one out of five people age 65 is continuing to work. Hey, yeah, it's a slight improvement over 2000. And part of this, well, what happened between the year 2000 and 2014? We kind of had this speed bump called the recession, the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, financial crisis, that kind of stuff. We had people here, uh, Judy Shepard, any of y'all know her? You know her, no? Yeah, no, you know her. Uh, she worked in counseling over there. Her office is where Bernadette is now. Uh, she was there, and she already, she was planning on retiring. Boom, financial crisis hit. She couldn't retire. She had to delay retirement for like three years. Judy had to work here three years longer because, I mean, she came up to me because I don't love her like I was. She got to ask me. So what's going on with this crisis? What's been, what do you think? And all that kind of stuff. And we sort of talked it through, worked it through, and she, she had to hang on for three more years. So that's part of why that number is a little bit higher. But 2014, we were just getting out of the recession. We are just climbing out of it now. I would say it's probably back down a little bit more now, if I could actually find that number again. So guess what? Back in 1950, half of the people age 65 were putting money into the bucket instead of taking money out of the bucket. Nowadays, 82% of the people are no longer putting money into the bucket and are taking money out of this bucket. And guess what? Life expectancy of 80, they're going to be taking money out of that bucket for 15 plus years. That's the problem that we're talking about. And then y'all familiar with baby boomers? All day, you know, the war ended and the soldiers came home in 1945 and they had the little twinkle in their eye because they'd been out there in the deserts of Africa or Europe or the islands in the South Pacific, they had a little twinkle in their eye. So starting in 1946, babies started hitting the ground, which they were 48. And they actually called baby boom all the way until like the early 60s. I'm like, okay. But what's happening to those people that were born in 19, so more babies born in 1945, 46, 47, 48 than average. And what's happening to those people that were born in 1945, 46, 47, 48? Add 67 years to that and get 
they're retiring now. So we had this big, huge honking wave of people go starting like a year or two ago. That for the next 10 years, there's going to be a big, huge group of people leaving the labor force. Big, huge group of people that are going to stop putting money into this bucket. Big, huge group of people that are going to start taking money out of this bucket. So it's already getting kind of shaky. And now you're going to have that big transition of givers are now takers. That's why this Social Security Fund is going to be looking kind of interestingly ugly here in like 10, 10 years from now. That's what the conversation needs to be and we need to go ahead and talk about it now so we have that much more time to adjust to it. Why the politicians aren't doing it. Everybody, they need to get their head out. Anyway. There's something to go. The nice thing about that. Okay. When are you making more income in your life? Early in your career or late in your career? Late in your career, because you didn't pay your raises or anything because of your experience, all that kind of stuff over time. So the, the people that are retiring now, the people with 30, 40 years worth of experience, people that are middle manager, upper managers, bosses of companies. So what's happening is a big group of people with big paychecks are stopping putting money in and starting to take money out. Which makes it even worse. All right. But guess what? There's a whole bunch of managers and middle managers that are about to what? Retire. How many of you are business majors? Woohoo, job openings. Ding, 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 ding. Right? Because a bunch of people are going to be leaving a lot of different industries. Now, you don't see like Walmart employees? No. We're not talking like, you know, cashiers and the lower level jobs? No. Because a lot of the, the, the older people that are going to be coming up and retiring, they're going to be a lot of these other middle management, supervisory, that kind of job, that kind of stuff. So you can start seeing it when you look at the list of, you know, fastest growing careers, nurses, and technology stuff are at the top of the list. But you can start seeing some of these management things start climbing up the list. They're going to go from the 30s on up into the 20s and it's going to creep up a little bit. So, woohoo. So, you business majors? Still have a hope. Still have a chance. Nothing else. Each. Take my job. After I retire in another dozen years. Okay. The Social Security costs us in terms of the benefits paid for society as a whole. They're taking 6.5% out of your paycheck, 6.5% out of my paycheck. And then my employers having, and your employers having to take another six and a half percent of your pay and put it in there. So the twelve percent of the national income is going into this bucket, be paying other people. What would you be doing if you had an extra twelve and a half percent? Spend your money. You know, spend our savings. Spend your savings. Yeah, y'all are young, so y'all be spending it, right? So how much better would you like to be with twelve percent more stuff? 12% more Cheetos, 12% more Dr. Beverage, 12% more video games, 12% more data on your data plan, 12% right? more room in your apartment, 12% larger cab in your pickup truck. That's what's happening to our society. That's one of the things because of this. And the other thing is, what did I talk There are people that ordinarily would not be quitting work, but are being able to quit work because they're simply going to qualify for these steps. So we have perfectly healthy workers that are choosing to no longer work because of Social Security. So how much work is not getting done because we have fewer workers than we would have had if this program isn't there? So society is different because of the existence of this program. A seniority paid less than Social Security. Yep. We all would end up being paid less because if Social Security did not exist because you know, you, you, they're not taking twelve and a half percent away from you, but guess what? The there's gonna be more workers, then you increase the supply, and what's gonna happen to the price, it's gonna go down. You know, we don't have to hire y'all because we have plenty of other old people hanging around and we can hire them. Right? It does sound bad, but y'all know what to Here's the other one. It's the number of younger workers declines, the status of social security funds changing. There is some delays for younger people to go into Social Security. I have asked this question before. Don't raise your hand unless you want to. 
How many of you would not be in college if it wasn't for financial aid? Because of financial aid, a lot of you are not working. A lot of you, because of educational financial aid, are not putting money in the social security bucket right now. But there's a lot of people, a lot of y'all like, well, you know, a college degree is a new high school diploma. You gotta have you gotta have a college degree in order to get a real job. So there's tendency for people to wait longer to enter the workforce, fewer younger workers. So it's delaying when y'all start putting money into this bucket, minimizing how many years you're going to be putting money into this bucket. But hopefully. Your paycheck is going to be bigger because you came to college, so they're going to be getting, you can be putting more money in for a shorter amount of time, and I'll believe there's still going to be more money going in this bucket. But there's that tendency. There's some other y'all know some other people that are just going to hang out and bum off. Y'all you know people in high school that are hanging out with their parents, living in their parents' basement, bumming off of them, and doing almost nothing. They ain't contributing to it. You know that dude you went to high school with is a drug dealer. He ain't contributing to it. I'm putting into it twice. I'm about to say job. Uh, what, um, what do you call it? I don't know that. Uh, I don't know that that means you get two points. Maybe I'll get one point. Uh, I'll get three months. I, I really thought about that. I, got, I kind of just assumed they were pulling out of both my paychecks. Oh, they're pulling out of both paychecks as far as earning you 40 credits oh. for qualifying. I don't think you're earning two because they're like, you, it's not two, jobs, if it's yeah. two 40 hour week jobs, then yeah, they give you double credit. But two points. It's just yeah. So you just get it more credit. It's new skill based on what you can add to page. Well, no, because it's I don't know, it's a small it's chunk out of two 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 cents. It's a so it, it still is a percentage. It's a thing. But the tendency things going on for younger people to wait to go to work, it's putting pressure on Social Security. Oh, uh, another interesting one. I just thought about this one. Y'all aren't having kids as young anymore. The amount of teenage pregnancy has gone down. The a average age of people getting married is going up. The average age of people having their first kid is going up. Because we're more focused on, we y'all, because it's y'all's generation, not mine. Uh, you're more focused on college, careers, and that kind of stuff than getting married and having kids. And so, you know, a lot of y'all are walking to a wedding these days. Maybe by 30. Where back when in my day, you know, the, a lot of the people in high school, they're already seeing how they're going to get married that summer after graduating. And how many of them were walking through the hallways pregnant senior year? But now that, okay, you know, y'all ain't like worried about college and careers, y'all worry about social media, Facebook, friends, playing video games, whatever. But y'all got other things in your life. So teenage pregnancy rates are reduced. The overall pregnancy rates are reduced. The average age of people having kids is later in life. The average age of people getting married is later in life. The average number of kids per family is getting lower. So what's happening on the lower end of the scale, the younger end of the scale, we're waiting that much longer before we're adding people to put money into the bucket. Don't trust that that bucket is going to be there. And as we talked about, don't expect to live off of that bucket because whenever we get to it, there is it is so it is minimal wage. I'm getting the word that slide is in here in the next chapter. Um, we're close to the end here, I think. Um, the whole idea I've mentioned this before for all of these programs is to transfer or redistribute income from one group to another. Taking from young people, giving to old people, taking from working people, giving to non working people, taking from rich people, giving it to poor people. Same thing when I was talking about B. Joseph and $100 bills at Walmart or whatever, I transferred some of the spending to him, but nothing he was getting created. That sort of the thing. You may or may not have heard of this. You will hear of this sometime when you get a little bit older. You, If you continue to hear about the greater world around you, the idea of a Lorenz curve. It compares the population of a country to the income distribution of the country. If it was that perfectly fair distribution of income, then half the people would be making half the money. A quarter of people would be making a quarter of the money, and if you were to graph it, you'd have this straight 45 degree line that would look like this. So, ideally, perfect income distribution, 20% of the people. Make 20% of the money, 40% of the people, make 40% of the money, and so on. 
Does that happen in reality? No, because there's some of us that don't make a whole lot, and then there's people like Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk. I've had a hard time finding updated numbers for this one, and it annoys me. Surely somebody needs to. But the census, they do, they did a census in 2010, they're going to do another one in 2020, and so this comes. They, they did a midterm thing thing, and so I got 2014 numbers with them. You take all the households in America, and you take the, line them up in order, from the person making the lowest money over here to the person making the most money over here, you line them up in order. Then you look at, okay, this bottom 20%, how much money are they making? In the United States, this bottom 20% is only bringing in 3.6% of the money. 20% of the people is living off of less than 4% of the money. This second group, 20% of the people is living off of 9.2% of the money. So add those two together. 40% of the people in America are living off of 9.10, like 13% of the money. 40%, almost half of the people, 13% of the money. Stick that middle group in there, middle class people. Lower class, lower middle class, middle class, upper middle class, rich hole. Right. The, the middle class, 20% is only making 15% of the money. 60% of the people are living off of 28% of the money. This fourth group, 20% of people are making 23% of the money. Woo good on them, they're pulling your weight. And then this top 20 is making 48%, or 49% of the money. A couple of years ago, they were making like 51% of the money. That never is adjusted. So, uh, just the way it's going. But this number generally has been growing. It just did literally shrink at one point. Probably as a result of the loss of value financial assets from the financial crisis. Um, if it's killing me, I can get But if we just go look at the top 20%, that top 20%. It's got 21% of the money. So a quarter of the rich folk, the, the richest quarter of rich folks have over have half of the money of the rich folks. So th this distribution among everybody remains in that top 20% that curve just keeps going sharp. If we were to graph it, it would look like this. 20% of the people living off of 3.6% of the money, total 14%. If you add them up, we're living off of 13% of the money. 60% total living off of 81%, I mean 28%. 80% of people are living off of 51% of the money, and then you got the rich folk living off half the money. This one ain't that bad. If you compare to some countries like, I don't know, South Africa in the 70s and 80s, Saudi Arabia right now, Saudi Arabia, you're either a member of the House of Saud, the royal family, or you not? The Saudi royal family owns the oil. Everybody else is getting a paycheck, gets their lucky, working for one of the oil companies. So this is a real dramatic change in the distribution of income there. 95% of the people are living off. I mean, 5% of the people got 70 some odd percent of the money. So that would be an extreme inequality there. So the point of these anti-poverty programs is to take that line, try to straighten it a little bit. Take some money from these people and give it to these people and even things out. That's the point of things. Smush their, smush their part of it, increase their part of it, and increase this all the way along. That's the goal. That's the dream. These transfer programs. Okay. Oh, I'm getting to it. Uh, dude, oh, I need to go. We're going to. Get to the poverty line, and then we're going to pair back to Social Security and minimum wage and that kind of stuff next time. So tune in next Tuesday. Just don't forget to cancel. Have a good week.